All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to get into Deuteronomy chapter 10. Let's just jump right in. First five verses, Israel had to go get back to the word of God, so God commanded the giving of new tablets of the law. So at that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourselves two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain, and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up to the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand and he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing the Ten Commandments which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire and the day of the assembly and the Lord gave them to me then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made and there they are just as the Lord commanded me so Moses broke the tablets of the law not only out of anger but also as a powerful visual representation of Israel's breaking of the law of God. Now God commanded that the law be restored by bringing forth two new tablets of the law. So God wanted his written word to be the starting point for Israel's right walk with him. Therefore, he restored the tablets, even writing on the second tablets with his own hand. And this is a powerful picture of the inspiration of God's word. Though God did not literally write the scriptures with his own hand, he did perfectly guide the minds and hands of the writers, so that the scripture is God-breathed in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, right? That is given by the inspiration of God. And let's look at that verse real quick. And we will find through through the structure of the text coming from outside of time that it was all orchestrated right by God himself all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness okay second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 so men moved by the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible right 66 books penned by over 40 authors so getting right with God after a time of rebellion must always begin and center on God's word. In the days of Josiah, king of Judah, repentance and revival came to the people of God when they focused on God's word again. In 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 8 all the way through uh, 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 25. So the Lord, acting on Moses' request not to destroy the people, rewrote the Ten Commandments on stone tablets. This indicates that God did annul the prior covenant, concluded in Exodus 24, verse 3. Probably each of the two tablets contained a complete copy of the Ten Commandments. This was normal in establishing the ancient Near Eastern uh, suzerainty treaties to which Deuteronomy had been previously compared. And so as God instructed, Moses made a wooden chest or ark in Exodus 25 verses 10 through 16 in which he then placed the tablets. This construction was done, of course, in connection with building the tabernacle in Exodus 37 verses 1 through 5 all the way through. Uh, and then we have Exodus chapter 40 verses 20 and 21 as well. All right, verses 6 through 9. In order to deal with Israel's sin problem, God established an enduring priesthood, right? So now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Bene Jachan to Maserah, where Aaron died and where he was buried, and Eliezer, his son, ministered as priest in his stead. From there, they journeyed to Gudgoda, and from Gudgoda to Jatbatara, a land of rivers of water. And at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord to minister to him and to bless his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. So this parenthesis, uh, speaking about the priesthood, demonstrated the need for priestly sacrifice and intercession and getting right with God after a time of rebellion. Israel needed the sacrifice, intercession, and blessing that the Levites would bring to the nation. The need for a priesthood shouted to Israel Israel, you can't do it on your own. You need to come to God through a mediator who will atone for your sin, pray for you, and bless you. If you refuse your priestly mediator and trust in your own ability to do these things, you will perish. 
So getting right with God after a time of rebellion must always have the focus on a priestly ministry of Jesus on our behalf. This work of Jesus is shown in his atonement for our sin at the cross, on his intercession for us in heaven, and on the blessing that he brings to us from heaven. So these verses may be an editorial insertion when Israel was at Masra, right? Aaron died according to Numbers 20 verse 28 and Numbers 33 verse 38. Aaron died on Mount Hor. Probably Masra is a dis- district where Mount Hor was located. The mention of Aaron's death indicates that the Lord also granted Moses' plea at Horeb years before to spare Aaron's life. Eliezer, Aaron's third son, became the high priest in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 6. And the Levites were given specific responsibilities in relation to the tabernacle in verse 8. So when Moses was on the mountain the second time in verses 1 through 5 for 40 days and nights, right, the first time in chapter 9 verse 9, he was involved in fasting and intercession for Israel in chapter 9 verses 18 to 5. Agreeing not to destroy the nation, God told Moses to lead the people on to possess the land. All right, verses 10 and 11, Israel needed to move on towards the promised land, so God gave Moses the command to go forth. As at the first time I stayed in the mountain, 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Israel's rebellion at Mount Sinai with a golden calf was significant. It was no small matter, yet God was not done with them. After they came back to his word and came through his priesthood, it was time to move on. God had a place to take them, and they had to get about the business of getting them. So getting right with God after a time of rebellion must always come to a place of progress again. It does no good to come back to the word, come through God's priesthood in Jesus, and then remain stuck in the same place. God wants us to move on with him, and when we are ta- walking right with God again, we will go in and possess the land. Right? So these verses are an introductory summary to the general exhortation in verse verses 14 through 22, having shown the impossibility of self-dependence in chapter 8 and the impossibility of spiritual pride in light of her rebellious history in chapter 9 and chapter 10, Moses called Israel to exercise her only option for survival, total commitment to the Lord. This is seen in several infinitives used, to fear, walk, love, serve, and observe. Such commitment was for their own good. In Micah chapter 6 verse 8 states, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. All right, verses 12 through 13, what the Lord requires of his people. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you, but to fear the Lord your God? to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you today for your good. So God requires from us a reverential honor towards him, not a fear that would make us shrink back, but a heart that so honors God that we would be hesitant to offend him. And God requires us to live our lives after the pattern he has set for us, to walk on his road, not on our own, right? So God requires us to love him. This means that the love he expects isn't a love that just happens, but it's a love that comes from a decision to set our affection upon him. And God requires us to serve him, to see all that we do as a service unto him, and to do all that we do as if doing it unto him. So God requires us to not only know his word, but to keep it in the sense of possessing it in ourselves, in the sense of protecting it. Every command of God is given for our good. They are never given so he can exercise his power, or so he can feel important. Every command he makes is with our best interest in mind, even if we cannot sense it or understand it. So verses 14 through 15, why God requires this of Israel. So indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, and also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Right. So God requires his conduct from his people because they are his special possession. Though heaven and earth belong to God, he set his focus and attention on Israel, beginning with their fathers. Right. So being chosen, having special attention of God focused upon you, is a place of great privilege, but also a place of great responsibility. Israel had a special responsibility to obedience. So the Lord is enthroned in the heavens, but and therefore is not part of creation, but is sovereign over all of it. Besides creating the universe, he owns it and all the nations on the earth. But he especially loved the patriarchs and selected them to be intimate
intimately related to him. And he chose their descendants, that is, he called them to be his witness. So the first reason Israel was to love the Lord is that he had initiated a relationship of love with this rebellious nation. The same principle is true of God's relationship with believers today. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 and 1 John chapter 4 verse 10. All right, verse 16, what it takes to fulfill what God requires. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So all males, <clears throat> all males among Israel had to be circumcised eight days after they were born. But this minor surgery was merely a symbol for the real work of cutting away the flesh, God that desired the work of taking our hearts inclined after the flesh and giving us hearts inclined after the spirit. So this theme would be repeated later in the prophets, right? Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 4. To fulfill God's law, it takes more than just being given a command. It takes an inner transformation, a transformation that only God can bring. God commanded them to do something that only he could do in them and to show them that basically the need to have the inner transformation and to compel them to seek him for this inner work. Israel is said to have uncircumcised hearts in Leviticus 26 verse 41, Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 26, and Ezekiel chapter 44 verses 7 and 9. All right, verses 17 through 22, a call to obedience, reverence, and compassion. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords a great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise, and and he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with seventy persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven in multitude. So the basis of this brief section of commands is set in the character of God. When God requires us to show justice, right, no partiality, nor takes a bribe, compassion, loves the stranger, and reverence, take oaths in his name, is because these virtues answer to aspect in God's own character. The obedience God calls us to is always set in the context of what he did for us. Our service and obedience unto the Lord is based on what he has done for us, and it is to be the great, grateful response to his goodness. If there is a lack of obedience and reverence, then there is almost always a lack of appreciation for what the Lord has done for us when he died on the cross and was raised on the third day. And this is true in two senses. First, he is the object of our praise. Second, he is also the one who makes us praise worthy any wisdom beauty or skill we show is not to our praise but he is your praise right so the proper response to their election by a sovereign lord was to circumcise their hearts an uncircumcised heart means a will that is hardened against god's commands it is another way of saying a person is stiff-necked or stubborn like in chapter 9 verse 6 and chapter 31 verse 27 thus the command to circumcise their hearts assumes that the human hearts are naturally rebellious and need correction Though human hearts are slow to change, Moses warned the nation that no bribe or anything less than an inward transformation could satisfy the Lord, who is great, who is the great God. God's treatment of the helpless, the fatherless, the widow, and the alien further illustrates his absolutely just character, right, showing no partiality, and highlights his requirement for Israel to be just. The mention of the alien in verse 18 recalls God's great deliverance of Israel with great and awesome wonders in verse 21 from being aliens in Egypt, right? Next is 23, verse 9. Therefore, the Israelites were to fear, serve, and adhere to, right? Or hold fast to in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 22, chapter 13, verse 4, chapter 30, verse 20. And they were to praise him. And as further encouragement to be faithful to the Lord, Moses called the people's attention to the fact that he had already fulfilled part of the promise to Abraham by multiplying their number like the stars in the sky. Genesis 15, verse 5, Genesis 22, verse 17, and Genesis 26 verse 4 and that ties up Deuteronomy chapter 10 next time we'll get into Deuteronomy chapter 11 rewards for obedience and the choice thank you for joining